Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for free premium sports picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Well, more beer for us. Yesterday, Terrence Crawford delivered, and he did so big time, knocking down Yorkie Scamboa four times on his way to signing his name to the list of, in my opinion, the 10 best fighters pound for pound in the sport. In the last two weeks or so, Terrence Crawford and Vasyl Lomachenko in very high level fights have proven to us that they are among the best in boxing. Now let me add something to that. Right? Understand that public opinion in boxing is unduly influenced, and I mean unduly influenced, by the few pay-per-view channels and few major promoters that we have in the sport, right? Unlike team sports, unlike, let's say, the NFL, where you have, you know, several different games going on, etc. In boxing, sometimes you have huge events, like this one, right? More than 10 thousand people, almost 11,000 people for the first championship boxing match in Nebraska for over a generation, right? This is the first fight in Nebraska for a boxing title, a pro championship involving a championship held by a Nebraska fighter since 1914. Right, the event was so big that the guy who fought Joe Fraser in the 70s in the last championship boxing match to take place in Nebraska was actually there at the fight and the camera repeatedly found him. Right now, in a sport with big events like this, where you have promoters and managers pushing their fighter, and when you have networks. Right, who understand that they get the most fans if they can propagate the biggest myths about popular fighters to draw in their crowds, you're going to have misinformation. Right, keep in mind too, the sport is not standardized. So, for example, in the Lomachenko fight, you look at Lomachenko's record, you see a small number of fights. And no one seemed to really do the math to figure out that Lomachenko may have fought higher level opposition as a professional than had Gary Russell going into that fight. Well, here, let's imagine the moment that was yesterday. And let's imagine who Terrence Crawford was. Now, I was fortunate. This was just dumb luck that the feed that I watched was the top rank feed. The top rank feed has two old school boxing hall of famers. They are, in my opinion, especially today, the best boxing team of announcers in the sport. It's Bob Sheridan. You may remember him. He used to do Don King events. And Larry Merchant, you may remember him. He used to do HBO events. Now, you know the way the sport operates. These guys were deemed to be too old or what have you in their former jobs. So they, of course, both have ended up with top rank, right? Doing the in-house feed for top rank events. Let me just say... This is lightning in a bottle. These two guys 
are like two New York City detectives trying to solve a murder case, right? Their approach to covering a boxing match is to look at the fighters. They have experience. They're too mature, quite frankly, to be caught up in a hype. So the skepticism about the fighters is on the surface, right? Bob Sheridan, for example, was a skeptic of a lot of the stuff that Terrence Crawford was trying to do. And, of course, these guys, as they pick up clues and learn about the fighters, as the fight goes forward, they share those clues and their conclusion with you, the viewer. Right? And it's different than, let's say, other networks where you have guys with great voices who don't have the backgrounds in the sport that these guys have. Right? Or... You know, uh, fighters who are excellent commentators, excellent commentators, but who don't have the sense of history that someone like, let's say, Larry Merchant, who's been covering boxing since, you know, the 50s, if not the 40s, has, right? So here it's interesting. It takes a lot to surprise Sheridan and Merchant. Both were surprised last night. Let's go through the moment. And I think the moment begins with one of boxing's most intriguing figures. If you're into profiling people's personalities like I am, just doing a quick sketch, if you're going to bet money, you need to know what's under the hood. right? You need to figure out when the bullets start flying, what is this guy going to do? Let's talk about 26-year-old Terrence Crawford. Let's pretend we're him for a moment. Right now, let's say you're a former phenom, because that's who he is. Let's say as an amateur, you beat Mikey Garcia and you beat Danny Garcia. In fact, you fought over 140 in the past. In your mind, and the public doesn't know it, but in your mind, you, the champ at 135, already feels that you could be the champ at 140 because you privately know that you've already beaten the champ at 140. I understand. I understand that the amateurs are not the pros. But just ask yourself, if you were to hop in the ring in an amateur fight against Vladimir Klitschko, hold your own for three rounds, and have your hand raised at the end, would that be a boost to your confidence? Now, let's say knowing that you beat Vladimir Klitschko in the amateurs, you were actually fighting against a guy who's supposed to be a knockout puncher at cruiserweight. Wouldn't you already feel that you had been in the ring with a bigger puncher? given that you had beaten the heavyweight champ? That's Terrence Crawford. Now understand the moment. I alluded to it earlier. Crawford's from Nebraska. Right? This is a huge moment in Nebraska's boxing history. The crowd is so festive that the crowd surprises even the old school guard in Bob Sheridan and Larry Merchant. They mention how people are literally dancing in the aisles in the arena. Now you're Crawford and you know the people are there to see you. They're not there to see the undercard. Right? The undercard fights Let's just call them lackluster, right? They're there to see you. Now, you understand, even though locally the fans are there to see you, internationally, your opponents better know. Yorkies Gamboa is an Olympic gold medalist, right? Yorkies Gamboa was on many lists as one of the top 10 fighters in the world. He was unbeaten going into the fight. 
people knew. They knew that Yorkies Gamboa had a hand speed advantage on Terence Crawford. Right? They questioned whether Crawford had ever fought anyone the level of Yorkies Gamboa. Right? The conventional wisdom. And if there's one thing I have learned in life, it is to always question conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom was that Yorkies Gamboa had fought vastly superior opposition to Terence Crawford. Vastly superior. Right? Now Crawford privately knew he'd been in the ring with Mikey Garcia. Right? Mikey is well schooled. Big Brother is Robert Garcia one of boxing's best trainers, right? Danny Garcia, who Crawford also be, is very well schooled. Say what you want about Danny Garcia's father. He's a hell of a trainer, right? So, the fight starts. Now let's look a little bit more deeply into Terence Crawford. And it's interesting. Gave an interview to HBO. Right? It's the HBO first look or whatever. That was going around. And Crawford is talking. It's hard to believe in that interview. In which he talks about having had an anger management problem. In which he talks about having been the guy. Who, as a baseball player, had problems with teammates. Right, when he talks about having been the guy who got thrown out of school for fighting. What's interesting in that talk is Crawford's temperament. When you see the interview, you're going to see a level of self-awareness that's astonishing. I didn't have my game together at 26, like Terrence Crawford does. Right? Terrence Crawford sounds like an old man looking back on his life. Right? He's 26 years old. 26. He's six years younger than Yorkie Scamboa. The moment the level of this fight against Gamboa in Nebraska didn't overpower Terrence Crawford. Crawford was ready. But let me be blunt with you. I was astonished. Even though I was there expecting Crawford to win, I was astonished by the stones on this guy. First round starts. I thought Crawford won the first round. Gamboa's hand speed advantage is obvious, but you know what I think of Gamboa. I don't think he's a chess player up close. Right? Gamboa is doing moves where rather than shoot a jab. He has his hand up and he's moving it like this. In other words, Gamboa really can't deconstruct you inside. He's just trying to see an opening and then jump in with both hands blazing. So Crawford is looking at him. Crawford's a counterpuncher. Now you need to understand counterpunchers. As I wrote in How to Bet on Gambling or How to Bet on Boxing, Gee, I don't even know the title of my own book, and now that's on film. As I wrote in How to Bet on Boxing years ago, like five years ago, counterpunchers spend the first two or three rounds of a fight figuring out your punch pattern, figuring out how they're going to dissect you, reading you, right? This is different than lead punchers who show up with the idea of, I'm going to knock you out. You know, he's going to adjust to me. I don't have to adjust to him. Counterpunchers are the opposite. They're not Fred Astaire. They're Ginger Rogers. Right? They're reacting to what the other guy does. They're doing everything the other guy does backwards. Right? They're seeing what the other guy does and processing it. So here you have Terrence Crawford against a guy with knockout power. And Terrence Crawford's reading him. In my opinion, Crawford wins the first round. Now, that's debatable. Let me say, I, I have not seen the HBO feed. 
right? The feed I saw was a top rank feed. I don't even know if Merchant and Sheridan gave Crawford the first round. I thought Crawford clearly wins the first round because Crawford is backing up Gamboa. Crawford is landing a jab, and let's talk about that jab. It's a left jab he's landing, right? He does enough to keep Gamboa engaged. As I said in the pre-fight video, Gamboa hadn't fought for over a year, and I questioned his stamina. When you're fighting a bully who wants to get you on your back foot, and that bully hasn't even been in the ring for a year and has defensive deficiencies. If you can come forward on your front foot, keep that bully engaged, force that bully to devote some of his energy to defense, then you're going to win the round. I thought that's what happened in the first round. Then we get to the second round. Right? And Crawford continues it. I thought Crawford won the second round. Now, I take it from Max Kellerman's post-fight interview that Max Kellerman and the HBO crew thought differently. But understand, Crawford's the technician inside. He's the one landing the jab. Yorkie's Gamboa is episodic. When Gamboa stands right in front of Crawford, he's not doing much. There's a height gap, and I know Gamboa has very confident body language, so it looks like he's doing a lot, and it's easy to root for the short guy who's showing some bravery. But I didn't see that short guy landing quality punches. Then we get to the third round, and the covers come off. We see Gamboa's real plan for the first time. He comes out at the start of the third round, and he tries to bum rush Terrence Crawford. Right now, let me just say this. A moment then takes place that is simply jaw dropping. It's beyond anything I expected. Now, don't get me wrong. Even though this moment surprised me, I'm not giving any money back to the casino. I'll take my money. But I didn't predict this. I don't even want to pretend that I saw this coming. I know I mentioned in the pre-fight video that Crawford was ambidextrous. I did not expect Terrence Crawford to switch to a southpaw stance and then to stay in that southpaw stance for several rounds. Folks, that's a boxing moment. That's a game changer. That's a jaw dropper. Let me just say, when Crawford switches to a southpaw stance, At first, I thought, okay, Crawford's doing the kind of move I've seen Andre Durrell do. I've seen countless fighters do, right? Andre Ward, right? You know, you figure, okay, this is going to be for about five or ten seconds. Maybe he'll do it for ten, twenty seconds. Some portion of a round. As that time went forward, and you slowly started to understand that Terrence Crawford, against a guy with superior hand speed, who's known for offense, knockout power, who was unbeaten, who was a Cuban champion and an Olympic champion, when you realize that Crawford thinks he can switch from righty to lefty, and fight a guy like Yorkies Gamboa out of a plan B stance. It literally started to feel as the realization slowly leaked in as to what Crawford was trying to pull off. It felt like watching Evil Knievel or some daredevil coming off the ramp 
trying to jump over a bunch of cars in a motorcycle. I was just looking at it, and I have to tell you, I mean, it was shocking. It was like watching a horror movie. I thought, you got to be kidding. I thought to myself, Terrence, don't you know? You can win this fight right-handed. What are you doing left-handed? The problem is, you know, it's the same problem switch hitters have in baseball. You're simply better from one side of the plate. Right? When you switch, okay, maybe you're ambidextrous with the jab. Are you ambidextrous with the footwork? Are you ambidextrous with the defense? Given your opponent's level of hand speed and power, are you as prepared from the left side in dealing with this speed and power and offense as you would be from the right side? Let me tell you in real time, Bob Sheridan, Boxing Hall of Famer, on the top-ranked telecast, criticized Crawford and said, what's he doing? Right? Sheridan said he's a better fighter from his normal side. He's not the same fighter defensively from this side. As the fight wore on, what we saw, simply put, in my opinion, was brilliance. Larry Merchant, a round or so later, then says, you know what? He's ambidextrous. This isn't a gimmick. Right? He says, this isn't a gimmick. He actually feels he's doing better from this side. Let me just tell you what happened. One of the secrets going into this fight was Terence Crawford's left hand. It's a huge left hand. It's as hard as anything Yorkie Scamboa throws, if not harder. Crawford has one punch knockout power in that left hand. Right? Crawford told you what he had done in the post-fight interview. When Crawford switches from the left up front in an orthodox stance to the left back here, right in a southpaw stance, Crawford, whose right jab is almost as good as his left jab, seemed to be able to soften up Gamboa who has limited defense, right, on his left side. Just figure out the math. Gamboa on his left side has a problem blocking a right jab. So then when Crawford would jump in with the left hook, Gamboa, who was having problems with Crawford's right hand, out of a southpaw stance was completely unprepared for Crawford's left hand. It was dazzling. It's jaw dropping. I'm telling you two emeritus mature announcers Sheridan and Merchant, who aren't afraid to tell you when they're surprised, we're both surprised. I'm telling you, I was watching the fight. I expected Crawford to deconstruct Gamboa from his orthodox stance. To see Crawford deconstruct Gamboa from a southpaw stance. To see Crawford show us that he's Tony Gwynn from both sides of the plate was simply one of those moments I won't forget for a long time.
Let's talk about Crawford too. Just mentally. When the bullet started flying, and he's in against a two-handed guy with superior hand speed. Crawford, and I believe he's going to have to clean this up. But Crawford crazily stayed in the pocket. Crawford's rolling with punches as Gamboa is mounting ambushes. He's not even moving away. Right? Crawford, actually, if you look at the feet, he's staying on his front foot for most of the fight. So when Gamboa starts throwing punches, Crawford, from the pocket, is throwing punches back. Crawford believes in himself so much that Crawford actually stays in there to trade with Yorkie's Gamboa. Now he gets hit. I know on the telecast they say, is he hurt in the ninth round? Of course he's hurt. Crawford's barely hanging on at the start of the ninth round. He gets caught. He gets caught. So what happens in that ninth round? After Crawford gets caught, while hurt, Crawford stays in the pocket and drops Yorkie's Gamboa twice, ending the fight. Sounds absurd, doesn't it? Please, look at the film. Let me just say this, too. Crawford's operating in broad daylight in the post-fight interview. And let me just say, you need to see the post-fight interview. Because you need to see Crawford's interpretation of having just brought home the biggest victory in Nebraska boxing in more than a generation. The crowd's going crazy. The crowd is totally into it. They're interviewing Terrence Crawford. Max Kellerman asked some question. Crawford first thanks God. You see a member of his team here. You can tell his crew hasn't tasted success like this, right? They're in front of their home fans. This isn't Ricky Burns' backyard. This is Crawford's own backyard. You see his crew behind him. Crawford, who has a CEO persona at 26, right? Keep in mind, this is different than older guys. Seeing Bernard Hopkins in his 40s or Floyd Mayweather in his 30s, with a CEO persona. No, this is a young guy. This is a young guy. Crawford has a CEO persona. Crawford makes sure that he thanks his entire team. Then he proceeds to answer questions. There's a certain flatness to the response because for Crawford, everything's technical. So Kellerman asks him, why did you change? To a southpaw stance and Crawford tells you why Crawford says I looked at him I saw that his left was low and I thought I could shoot a jab over it how talented is Terrence Crawford rather than shoot that jab toward Gamboa's low left hand from Crawford's orthodox stance, Crawford decides to change his stance and change his jab hand. So Crawford's landing not a left jab, he's landing a right jab. And he defends himself from his plan B stance. Crawford gets four knockdowns in the fight against an unbeaten Olympic gold medalist. Let me hear from you. This fight was a moment in time. It's shocking. It's shocking. I'm not here to say Crawford did everything the right way. 
He does get hit with punches. He does trade with Gambo, in my opinion, a bit too much. But when you look at the film and you realize he's the one stalking Gamboa. When you look at the film and you realize as good as Crawford looks, he's not even fighting out of his normal stance. When you look at the moment and you realize that Crawford at 26 is not overwhelmed by it. All I can say is it's an A-plus performance from a guy who is among boxing's best. If I'm Danny Garcia at 140, I certainly don't fight this guy again. Crawford's going to gain weight. Understand, Crawford really belongs at 140. But he just beat Ricky Burns and Yorkies Gamboa as the lightweight champion. I'm telling you, boxing has a lot of sharks in the water that you don't know about. You need to know about Terrence Crawford. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.